you still throwing the rock some? Like, I know you get out with your kid. Are you still, like, slinging it some? Do you have a shoulder pain? Like, what's going on with that old wing of yours, Ozzy? <laughs> Oh man, the shoulder feels shoulder feels good. Just turned yeah. uh, forty in December, and I, I uh, Ben needed someone to come out and, and service um, Fuller and Johnson this past yeah. summer. So Roan and I went out there, and and I threw it a bit, probably yeah. six, 60 to eighty throws, something in there, and wow. and Ben was like, man, you still got it. Yeah, but that's we we didn't throw anything over thirty five yards, so yeah. I, How would you feel the next day? I was safe in that range. Yeah, you feel shoulder good the next felt day? fine. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Shoulder felt felt fine. I spend the majority of my time throwing uh, TDY size balls, so yeah. you get that NFL ball in your hand again. You're like, what the heck is this? It feels like a big. damn soccer ball. They're so much bigger, right? <laughs> Yeah. Hey, how, how much longer before your son passes you up? Sophomore year of high school, like in all, and realistically, like what do you think? Freshman, sophomore year of high school, as as you're declining, he's yeah, declining. Yeah. And, oh, and just and, throwing and the rock, what? and just just throwing the rock, just because we're gonna get into it. But oh you, man, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it'll it'll probably be, uh, I would say probably somewhere in there, a freshman yeah. sophomore year. I mean, his arm yeah. his arm is getting substantially stronger every year he's got pretty big hands for his for his age he's i think he's just a shade under five three right now uh just turned yeah. 11. So he's like 110 112 pounds yeah. um he's lean he's he's leaned up quite a bit he's got long levers so yeah he's, he's built <laughs> he's a little thicker on the bottom half i bet yeah i bet his junior senior year he's six two to six four 215 220 pounds he'll he'll be built a yep. little different than i than i am yep. just based on his bottom half yeah um, yeah is he gonna have your wheels you think he's gonna be as fast as you are people don't i don't know if people remember how fast you were man i don't know so <laughs> i I try to think back to like when I was his age, I was always one of the faster kids. He's actually got pretty good top end speed yeah. and he's for, for his size, he's fairly shifty. Um, but I, you know, that's, that's a tough one because I was, yeah. I was like a four, I think at the Nike combine going into my senior year of high school, I ran four, seven, six. And yeah. then, and then the NFL combine on the laser, I ran four five one four five five. Fast fastest so, quarterback at the combine, by the way. When you when at your combine was it oh seven or oh eight? What was your combine class? That, that was the oh seven combine. Yeah, fastest yeah, I, quarterback I was, at the combine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was the fast. I had the fastest, uh, the fastest uh, five ten five of any offensive player that year. I. I I tied with two other receivers with a 408. Wow! So I, 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 uh, I could always move. move. That was yeah. that was never move. the issue. Yeah, yeah. There was I other, remember, other uh, issues that I had. <laughs> ben, our, our good close friend, would always, would always whenever uh, he introduced you to someone, I always remember him bringing up fastest quarterback of the NFL Combine in 2007. Uh, well, Z, let me introduce us uh, real quick, and, and we'll keep chugging along. Uh, super excited to have Jared Zabreski as a guest in the QB Spotlight podcast. Again, we're just a big quarterback hub. We talk all things quarterbacks, and so we got great guests like Jared that, that come on. So everyone listening and watching, of course, will know Jared. If, if you're like 10 years old and you don't, uh, we, the Boise State, great. Uh, spent time in the NFL, CFL, over 8,000 yards passing at Boise State, 58 passing touchdowns, 31 rushing touchdowns that we talked about. Fastest quarterback at the 2007 NFL Combine. So if I butcher anything, Z, go ahead and uh, go ahead and, and correct me. Hey, w when's the last time you 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 ran a 40? Do you run at all? Or you just you just you just spin it with your kid. Say that one more time, Steve. W w when's the last time you ran? Are you still like for those that know like like me me and Jay go we go pretty far back um, at the same workout facility and, and Jared was Jack, dude. He used to be Jack. I hope he still is. Um, but it's probably been a few years since since we've been able to hang out. But I, I was asking, do you still you still get up to the gym and, and lift some heavy weight and run around a little bit? 
Yeah, you know what? Uh, my cardiovascular endurance is not what I would like it to be these days. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. have kind of, I kind of moved, I moved into more of a, a bodybuilding regiment yeah. for a while, but I've, I've been yeah. doing more plyos lately and, and doing nice, more, good. doing more functional mobility. Uh, you know, I, I play quite a bit of golf and that's, yep. that's my, that's my main hobby. And that's huge, dude. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to eventually, uh, start competing. I kind of got okay. a ten-year plan, Stephen. Come on. I would like to, would like to play on the senior PGA tour. And, Let's get it, dude. And, and it's 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 a grind, but I've yeah. I've been able to get my handicap down to a five-two. Okay. And my goal in two years is to get to a scratch. Okay. Um. So the the stuff that I'm working on now is really uh, stability of the lower half and yep. mobility of the thoracic and, and yeah uh, so I, I i do quite a bit of that um i'm not quite as as beefy as i once was uh, yeah yeah you know I, I used to sit around 220 and i'm probably 204 right now which nice that's way to be exact that's, yeah <laughs> yeah well you live it you live in our world long enough bro it's yeah. like 204.2 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dude that's that's awesome dude and we were talking about your son too uh up and coming quarterback you gonna you gonna push him towards boise state or are we gonna are we gonna let him make his own decision man you know what i don't have to push him he's yeah. he is he he wants nothing more than to go to boise state and and it, his it's pretty blue, it's pretty, huh? Yeah, man. He was born bleeding blue, and that's oh, it's awesome. You know, unfortunately, that's a long ways from Texas. Um, yeah. But you know, and, and there's a lot of good football played down here in the South, and we're pretty, yep. pretty blessed and fortunate to to be in the woodlands and to to play in such a competitive area. Um, he loves football, man. Like we were chatting, awesome. he's he's yeah. so cerebral. He's you know, I, we put in 24 plays. Uh, you know, we started with an install of about 12 plays and got up to 24 by the end of our tackle season. Yeah. And we had a, you know, a 24 play, play call on the wrist. It was double sided, and we would signal in from the sideline the number of the play. And he got to where at the end of the year he didn't even have to look at his wristband. I could just give him the the, the number. You know, yeah. play 13 and he'd go right into the huddle and his ability to make decisions quickly see defenses throw the ball with accuracy like it's a, it's a, it's another level man and it yeah and yeah. uh it's a it's a lot of fun to watch yeah. and to be a part of and that's that's been such a godsend is just yeah. his passion for sport because it's it's something that we connect on and we Man, he he's like an encyclopedia of football knowledge, Stephen. He's That's like awesome. he he'll, he'll talk about teams from the '70s and '80s. Yeah. And his, his favorite running back of all time is Tony Dorsett. Like it's nice. Okay. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty neat, dude. Dude, well, it's because it's because he's got a, a one a, a great dad who, who loves him and spends time with him, and then uh, a great coach and yourself as well. So uh, we'll be looking out for him in about that. five or six years, whenever. Whenever he uh, he starts hitting the recruiting trail, and, and we'll, we'll be putting some uh, some content on him, pushing him towards Boise State. Uh, but with with that said, of course he bleeds blue, and so do you. At a high school, wh what led you to Boise State? Like, what was your recruiting process like? I know like it's crazy these days, but like, what was it like in you know the the early mid two thousand when you were getting recruited? Well, you know what we we used to have to send our recruiting tape out on VHS. Right, right. Right. So it was very, very different. And I grew up in a town of about 10,000 people. Um, and we were, we were a big high school for Oregon. We were 4A at the time. And the largest division in Oregon was 4A. And we were on the small side of the 4A. So we, we had, you know, we didn't have much depth, but I had some awesome teammates who ended up going and playing collegiately at other places. So I had I had guys, but we, it wasn't like we were a recruiting hotbed. Right. And um, fortunately, I was able to go to a few invitational camps, like the Nike camp in or at uh, the University of Oregon, 
and then I went to uh, my team went to the team camp at Boise State going into my senior year in uh, high school I played four sports uh, I played football basketball baseball and golf golf my freshman year and I didn't play baseball because they coincide and you couldn't play two sports and then after that uh, I ended up playing baseball um, and I was an all-state shortstop and an all-state yeah. point guard and mm-hmm. didn't receive any honors in football as far as as far as state honors but my junior year was a big year for me um, I was first team all conference in all three and, and got a lot of recognition that way um, so that kind of piqued interest of of different colleges. My recruiting process was kind of strange. Um, yeah. I was recruited by the Midwest. I was recruited by some Ivy League schools. So Purdue uh, recruited me fairly heavily. Uh, and the recruiting coordinator at Purdue ended up leaving and going to the University of Idaho. Okay. And then he recruited me at Idaho. And then I went to the Boise State camp uh, and was MVP of the camp. And so that I was able to uh, you know, start getting quite a bit of recognition yeah. and, and I got on their radar that way. Um, I was recruited by a couple Ivy league schools, yeah. uh, had conversations with both Prince, uh, Princeton and Harvard. Uh, they both asked me to retake my SATs. Um, yeah. and they weren't offering uh, full scholarship. They were offering, right. uh, partials and I got offered by the university of Idaho. Um, Oregon, Oregon State asked me to preferred walk on. Okay. Um, and late in the recruiting process, Boise State came in, and, and uh, I really enjoyed my my trip and my time at Boise State and yeah. the program, the the acceleration of the program there. Um, it was it was really kind of a no brainer for me. Uh, yeah. Chris Peterson and and staff there how much love they showed me and, mm. and man, I think we all know now uh, yeah. about Chris Peterson and yeah. he's, he, he's one of the, the greatest offensive minds I've ever been around. And I've been around some good ones, man. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan coached me uh, with the Texans and Gary Kubiak and Bruce Arians <laughs> and uh, Mike Sherman and coach Pete. Uh, yeah. He, he's, he's as good as Kyle is now. So, man, Dude, so I, I want to go to, to, to two things that you mentioned. One, you played four sports in high school, right? So obviously you focused on each sport, but it wasn't like a year-round thing per se. You, you had multiple sports, and you were good at all of them. What, do you think that helped you in your development as a quarterback, like like playing multiple sports and being good at, 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 at golf and being good at baseball and just like your overall development, even though like – not every day of the week you're focused on being a quarterback, but there's still skills that transfer from those other uh, movements to being a quarterback. Do you think that kind of helped guide you without even really knowing it at the time? Oh, not even kind of, Stephen. Yeah. That that was one of the biggest parts of my development as a quarterback and as an athlete was was <clears throat> playing multiple sports. It, it helped yeah. in so many regards. It it. it, it diminished any um, feeling of overuse or burnout. Uh, I was excited for each upcoming sports season. Uh, the The movements required um, are similar, but differentiate enough to yeah. where you're, de- you're developing different dexterities and, and coordinations. And then you, what's required of, of each of the positions, whether it's shortstop pitcher, outfield, uh, hitting a baseball, swinging a golf club, making a no-look pass in basketball, you know, the shuffle or the side runs that are required in each sport, man, it's uh, unequivocally, you're mm. not going to duplicate that by mm. a 365-day training regiment as a quarterback. Yeah. And, That's and, so and good, I think, dude. I think where we've gone to these days, Stephen, is is this specialization and and – I think that there's more uh, there's more negative aspects of specialization than there are positive benefits. Now I know I know it's hyper competitive, especially like here in, in the Woodlands and in Austin where you're at. Yeah. And these kids these kids want to you know be the guy, but I, I think there's something that's really really missed there. Uh, yeah. when you're looking at uh, the development of an athlete and it's uh, holistically. 
No, I, I agree 100 percent. And it's cool to hear you talk about that. And this is something we could probably talk about for, for hours. There's a book you may have heard of it. I, I know our, our good uh, our good friend Ben has. It's called Range by Malcolm uh, Gladwell, I believe. Gladwell. And, uh, love, have you, love have, Malcolm have you, Gladwell. I haven't have read, read that, that one book? yet. Though. OK, no, it's I've called read Range. a lot of his others. Yeah, it, it's about it's it's called range, and then like it, it's about like why generalists rule the world or something like that, like why generalists are over specialist type deal, and it, it, it it's outstanding. I'll reference the book below, but you should definitely check it out. It kind of goes right hand in hand with what you say, and like at some point, yeah, like specialization happens and takes over, but when you're like in your developmental years per se, like you were in middle school and high school, um, there's a lot of just like. There's a lot of, of movements and skills that, that that cross each other, right? There's like a carryover effect. Uh, and I, I know we only have a little bit of time, so I won't spend too, too much time on that, but that's something we could talk about for hours. It, what, what, one more thing I want to to hit on with, with kind of what you said in your opening was you talked about Chris, uh, Coach Chris Peterson being this uh, one of the most brilliant offensive minds you've been around. Can you maybe give a – a story about him or an example about uh you, you know how he impacted your career or, or like just your development in general based off how he coached you whether it was like a certain play or a certain design or just like being around his presence can you kind of give a an example of that if you don't mind oh man i got a ton of them but yeah. i mean just in general there wasn't there there wasn't a defensive schematic that he couldn't beat and yeah. the his offense which was kind of a variation of of uh, the West Coast offense. He called it an open scheme, which, okay. man, it 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 fu- fundamentally at its core was a West Coast offense um, that was kind of derived from the inception of, of Walsh's offense. You know, with the Niners, <clears throat> it's a it's a very simple offense uh, in the scheme of of offenses. Um, Kyle Shanahan runs it today. Yeah. It's it, and they talk about oh well, well, Purdy runs. You know, they're the offense is dumbed down or simplified. Well, you, as an offensive play caller and as a scheme builder, you don't want a complex offense for your quarterback. You want to give them simple pre-snap reads and adjustments and and direct reads post-snap. So it's a one safety, two safety offensive uh pass uh game plan and you identify where you're going pre-snap and then you solidify that post-snap and Mm -hmm. and you're you're able to get to stuff really quickly well coach pete would would see a defense and we could we could beat that defense with with our playbook in multiple sets and and the genius behind Coach Pete was we had probably 125, 150 different pass plays. Well, we had 600 ways to get to them. Wow. And we would do that through shifts. We would do that through personnel groups. And we would do that through motions. But we would ultimately get to the same concept and we would beat it with different personnel. Mm. And and the personnel, uh, it's it's a matchup uh, environment in college and, and especially in the NFL. You you find a matchup that you want to exploit based on your personnel strengths. And he could he could sit on a Saturday Sunday or Sunday Monday and have what looked to be the next Saturday a completely new playbook, but it was the same set of plays, Mm. which made it simple for the quarterback, but complex for a defense. And and the way that the way that he would confuse defenses with the shifts and the motions, and you see it in today's game, Andy Reid and Kyle Shanahan with their play calls, they would shift from one set and, and one look that would get a defense making a call pre-snap and then they would shift to another set which would make the defense force a different call to match the different set and then they would motion back to a you know two or a three receiver so the defense is constantly in the midst of making calls and adjustments and then they're confused and boom you got them 
And, and at the quarterback position, all you need to know is, okay, I'm shifting from bunch to trips on the left. And then I'm sending my inside receiver to the right. So now it's two by two. And, and with all that happening, I'm identifying with the motion if it's man coverage or zone. And then my read goes, okay, is it two safety, one safety? Okay, it's two safety. Now I go to my flat defender, flat defender bites. I'm throwing the hook. Like mm. it, it's, it's not, okay, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to make a line call. And then, oh, I got pressure here. So I'm going to send the line here. And then I'm going one, two, three, four, five. It's, yeah. it's so simple. You're getting one, two, check down, one, two, check down. And it, he, he could do that versus anybody. He made the quarterback position really, really simple. Wasn't easy, but it was simple. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it was pretty neat to be a part of. And then obviously, uh, you know, what I, what my team and I was remembered mostly for was the, the Fiesta Bowl, right? Yeah. And those three, those three gadget right. plays. Right, and right. His, his like how we practice these plays to perfection yeah man we have we had perfect practice uh thursdays where the ball wasn't hitting the ground and we would run you know we'd be at 80 percent against our scout team and we would run deep routes go routes post routes and we were so good. And, and I had three NFL receivers and an NFL yeah. tight end. And not many people recall that, but yeah. uh, I had some dudes. And we would we would throw the ball 50 times in practice, and the ball wouldn't hit the ground. Mm. I mean, we were we were sharp and, and yeah. dialed in, and we were senior laden. And man, it was a it, fun team to be a part of. Man, yeah, as yeah, I, I want to touch on that because man, we could talk X's and O's forever. Like, like, like you just explaining those offenses was like educational and, and enlightening for me. Like that was um, like a clinic you, you just put on. So w w with that said, though, I do want to talk some, I know even probably everyone that meets you or talks to you probably brings up that, the, uh, the Fiesta Bowl, right? And, uh, but I kind of want to talk about what you mentioned. Like you talked about like a practice that to perfection. Like what was the lead up to the game? Like how was that practice? Was there anything different that practice week where y'all just like, just super dialed in, you know, you know, you hear these stories about, you know, teams that go to bowl games and, you know, they're having a good time partying at night, like not taking it too, too seriously. Like it doesn't, that doesn't seem like that was the case for, for y'all. So what was that practice that lead up? Maybe take us through the week prior to the actual game. Well, we got, well, we get out there and then the first night uh, we kind of had an extended curfew. So we went and enjoyed Scott Stell as a team. Yeah. Um, but the rest of the week, it was it was all business. And mm -hmm. the thing for for me personally, and I think for our team was, you know, we had some <clears throat> really big learning experiences. We played Georgia in 2005. We opened the season. We were ranked 16. They were ranked 14. It was the biggest kind of preseason game of the year. We were coming off of 11 and no season previously uh, or 11 and one. Sorry, we lost in our bowl game to Louisville. Mm -hmm. which was which was kind of our coming out party um a great liberty bowl that we lost 44 to 40 i threw a hell mary late mm -hmm. uh, and it was picked off in the end zone but we we went into that georgia game and it's kind of a long story long but we That's went into great, that yeah. georgia game and and we felt like okay we needed to be superman and me personally i i, I need to make you know all these plays and you know i'm the guy that that needs to carry the team and and, you know, preseason Heisman and uh, Heisman list and all this other stuff that I kind of bought into and didn't yeah. have my mind exactly where I needed it. And and what what I learned was is that nothing needed to change. And and I didn't need to press and I didn't need to be Superman because I was good enough. Yeah. Um, and in the learning experience that we took from that Georgia prep to the Oklahoma game was nothing needed to change. Mm -hmm. We just needed to focus on our responsibilities individually. And as a team collectively, collectively run the plays that are designed, do your job. What's your responsibility on this play? You don't need to put on a Cape and, and make an 85 yard run or, or throw six touchdowns. It's, 
operate within the structure of the offense. So that week was, we treated it like it was a, it was another game. Now, as a player going into a bowl game, a BCS bowl game like that, you know, it's a little bit different, but if you take that mindset of this is another week, we've gotten here because we've won 12 games to get here. And we got here by preparing the same way every week. And that was foundationally fundamentals in making sure that the play is called right, that the offense Mm -hmm. breaks the huddle correctly, that we get in and out of our shifts and motions, that my cadence is the same, that I'm making the reads and taking my steps and throwing on time, like operating within that mindset that the plays are going to happen and the game's going to flow. And so we prepared that way. We prepared the same way that we did the prior uh, game prep uh, for the the uh, Nevada Reno Wolfpack, you know, mm-hmm. the start of December as we did for that bowl game. And that, that was extremely important for us. Mm-hmm. And then, it, you know, yeah, plays it, happen it, it, and, yeah, and Z, Z, Z Matt, I think that's super dope, dude. You you mentioned uh, before uh, talking about that, you mentioned the, the the gadget plays, but I think it's y'all won because of the preparation, because of the game. Like you didn't win because of three plays, right? You won because of preparing and and how you played throughout the game. Then of course those you know those amazing gadget plays, as you as you call them, will always be remembered. Uh, the Statue of Liberty, the the hook and lateral lateral play, but the preparation kind of led y'all to just be in that position. So. Let, 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 let's go to that part of the game whenever they called it was hook and lateral and then the statue of liberty play like let, let, let's go to that part of the game when they called the game or when they called that play one you're probably like hell yeah let's go this is kind of exciting like anytime you're a quarterback um and they call a trick play it's always kind of exciting and like nerve-wracking at the same time but did you did you like expect it 100 percent to work like when it worked we're like oh wow let's go win this thing or like like what was like going through your mind when it was called when it happened and then after it happened so they had, they had scored late to tie the game. It was it yeah. was twenty five or uh, twenty eight to to twenty eight, and we had the ball with about a minute and twenty something left. And the first play we called was an all go. Uh, we called it crash. It was cross the hash, and our outside receivers have read routes. Uh, they sit down versus off coverage or versus cloud or press. They'll go. Mm. And I misread the coverage and I threw wide side. What I was trying to throw was a stem route and my receiver converted it to a go and they picked it for six. So we went down 35 to 28 and we got the ball back with, I think a minute and two left. So we, we had to drive the length of the field to score. And we, the first few plays from scrimmage, we got big chunk yardage, got down to midfield. And then we got, uh, got kind of stammered and, and ended up with a fourth and 18, you know, fourth and 18, we called, uh, trips, right slide, left circus and circus is the hook and ladder. And we called it circus, uh, because that's what it would always turn into. It was, hmm. it was the damn ringling brothers, uh, hmm. at practice, the play Steven never worked, not a single time. Oh my gosh. And, and the, the great thing was, is that my team, my line, my receivers were so dialed in that when I got the call from the sideline and I had them signal it twice, I I needed them to verify that that was actually what I was seeing. Yeah. I walked into the huddle and called the play with confidence. No one batted an eye. We went and got lined up. My running back lined up on the wrong side. I had to grab him and put him on the correct side, which was uh, detrimental to the play because I needed him to to pull the linebacker on the weak side to the flat. And then he was the secondary pitch guy. And then I was the tertiary pitch guy. So there's so many things that had to go right within that sequence. And thank God I get the ball and and it's a clean pocket and I got a pretty big lane to throw into. And as soon as I spun it, I took off sprinting down the side and, and the ball left my hand early enough. And Dryson James, great hands, was able to hand catch it and give two steps like he was going to run across the field with it. And then that was enough to get the corner to bite on him and trail him. And then he gave a pitch to Gerard Rabb coming on the ladder. 
and then Rab caught it and beat everybody to the end zone. And man, it was, it was amazing. Cause wow. big, big situation yeah. for fourth and 18. Wow. Uh, yeah. he, he goes into the end zone as basically as time expires, man, it was yeah. for the first time for a play to work. What a time, yeah. huh? Hey, it only needs to work once, right? Like you can, it can be That's one right. for a hundred, but as long as it works in the game, then, then, then you're doing something right. And then did, did y'all go for two after that? Remind me, or is that an overtime? No, oh, this, no it was an okay. overtime. So okay. we kicked the, kicked the extra point. <clears throat> they got the ball first in overtime, Adrian Peterson, 25 yards for a touchdown first play. Oh. And then it took us a bunch of plays to get down. Uh, and we had, I think fourth and six, and um, we ran, I motioned out of the backfield. And I wasn't too happy about this play call. It's like, you know, fourth down, we're going to throw the ball. Let me throw it. Well, yeah. Coach Pete was a genius, calls a halfback pass. And I motioned out of the backfield. And Vinny Peretta, a freshman who was a stud, gets the direct snap and tucks it like he's going to run a sweep. And Derek Schumann slides out. And Vinny puts the ball high and away, away from the linebacker, and Schumann catches the ball uh, for a touchdown. And then, uh, you know, we were tired, man. That was that was kind of the separator for us was, you know, our, our top 25 guys were as good as any 25 guys in the country. I think we had 12 guys either get drafted or signed with NFL teams that year, which mm-hmm. was higher than, I think, quite a few more than Oklahoma had. Um, and, and one of the highest in, in college football, uh, for senior classes that year. And, but after that 25 guys, bro, we, we just, we didn't have the depth. We were, yeah. we were dog tired and coach P said, Hey, let's go for two. Now this play, the statue, that play worked every time mm. we, we would run it against the scout team and no matter like the scout team, we, Boise State's got smart guys. That's that yeah. was something that that we prided ourselves on. Guys that could figure it out, smart guys. Our scout team, after the second or third time in the week, they would see a set formation. They'd be like, "Okay, plays going here," and they'd be talking to each other. <clears throat> they never could figure it out, dude. Like we mm-hmm. ran it 50, 50 times in practice wow. that year, never figured it out. And the ball handling was was so keen. Uh, that, I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And, and the, the ball handling, we, we had changed halfway through the year. Nick Lomax, uh, if you remember the Lomax name, his dad, Neil Lomax, uh, was a uh, quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals for a number of years. Right. And Nick was like 6'8", huge hands. And he was messing around. He was like, what if we kept the ball in our left hand and empty hand, you know, motioned like we we're throwing it with our right and handed it behind our back. And Coach Pete goes, that's pretty slick. He goes, do you think you could do that? And I said, yeah, I think I can. So we tried it, and, man, it made a huge difference. So that that play was called. Uh, We were going for the win. My job was to keep it simple. Get the the receivers out of the huddle on hurry up. Make sure everybody was lined up. My receivers got out there. Two guys were on the line. So, you know, I waited, and uh, Gerard Rabb backed up – or. uh, Legadu backed up off the line, got the ball snapped, and then the key was just don't clip feet with Ian. Make sure mm. that the balls. And his his coaching technique was he peeks out like he's watching the pass, and then he grabs it from my hands as opposed to a quarterback putting it in the pocket. He grabbed yeah. it from me, and if you look at that play, bro, my foot goes right over the top of his as I'm continuing my drop. And uh, thank God. Um, that it, it didn't clip it and uh, we were able to walk off the field in celebration of, <laughs> of, in my opinion, the greatest college football game ever played. Man, absolutely. Every, every college football fan junkie will remember watching that play. I was in high school watching it, just being like, Oh my gosh, like rubbing it into all, all my OU friends uh, faces. And um, man, what, what a great story. And Z, thanks so much for like walking us through that. I think that's a pretty cool inside i know you got to get out of here in a few minutes but we're definitely gonna have to do this again uh for sure but before we get you out um did you have a, like a, a pre-game routine any music you listen to before the game or do you just kind of just show up and, and everything was different no it so so my routine was uh you know it's pretty structured for for college athletes you come from the 
pregame meal right over the locker room. And I would, I would make sure that I got, you know, my stuff on and got taped up. I'd always get taped by the same trainer. Um, yeah. Brandon would tape me and then I would go out and, and uh, throw some routes, uh, get my arm warm, get, get loosened up. Um, we typically have music rolling uh, out on the field and, yeah. Um, it was just more about being with the guys at that time, you know, yeah. getting loose, having fun. Um, you know, for me, you know, my mindset shift my senior year, uh, it was a big shift. I had a, I had a challenging junior year performance, uh, wise and, and I pressed a lot and, and there's a lot that goes into that. So we, we do need to have another session. I think there's a lot yeah. that I'd like to share with, with young quarterbacks on the mental side of, of athletics and sport. Yeah. Um, but it, it really came down to uh, controlling what was in my control and yeah. what's in my control is, is the way that I prepare and, and the way uh, that I respond and the, and the behavior and uh, unto which. And, and so it was, it was really just about keeping things simple, keeping to the basics, let my, my athleticism, uh, you know, just kind of uh, unfold naturally throughout the game and not trying to press and create plays and, and sticking to the offense and making sure the play is called correctly in the huddle and that the offense gets out of the huddle correctly and that my guys know what they're doing and, and making my reads. And it really came down to the cadence and a drop and, and making sure that my eyes were in the right spots and it was one play at a time. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. it's a cliche in sports, one play at a time. But that's that uh, if you have that mindset, um, not looking at, hey, let's go 13 and 0 this season. Hey, let's let's uh, win this game. It's more about, hey, let's practice this rep yeah. at, the, at our full capacity and with with full, full effort, because really, really the only two things that you're in control of, brother, is is your attitude and your effort. And that, mm. that is a cliche that's a, a resounding cliche and it's a cliche for a reason because that's the only thing that holds true. You can't control what other people think or what other people do. Um, um, And and a lot of times you can't control a lot of the thoughts that'll run through your head, but, uh, or the feelings that come from it, but having an interpretation in the the right perspective, you know, when those thoughts come into your head and, and knowing that you're in control of, of your feelings, you know, based on those, based on those thoughts. Uh, yeah. And that you're in control of the outcome with your attitude and the way that you behave and treat people and your effort mm. mm-hmm. um, is because because one thing that I've I've always prided myself on and, and I I coach and parent my children on the, the the grades and the the athletic achievements those those will all come if you put in the effort and you, and you do it with a smile on your face yeah. Yeah. No, Z, that, that is so good, man. And you, you, we're definitely gonna have to have you on because I, I want to talk, you know, more about co- college quarterbacks this year and, and the Boise State quarterback situation. Like we, we'll get into that another time. And I always end the show like getting guys to give advice to younger QBs. But, like what you just said was like advice right there and, and just like controlling what you can control and treating people with respect. So um, I know you got to get out of here, too, but we're definitely going to have have you on again. Z, I'm about to wrap this up. Just stay on for like another minute or two. Um, okay. I'm about to wrap this up, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Sorry, Jens, for your time, man. This was awesome, super educational, enlightening, and just some really cool insider kind of stuff. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to have you on again and, and talk Boise State stuff and, and some more college stuff. But uh, with that said, everyone, if you like this video, like, share, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff. We put out quarterback content on a regular basis and have great guests on, like like Jared Zembranski here. So uh, thanks for watching, and yeah, like, share, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. We'll see you next time.